Welcome back to the course on uh, computer networks and uh, internet protocol. Uh, so, we are looking into the different functionalities of the transport layer of the protocol stack and in the last class uh, we have looked into that what different services the transport layer can provide on top of uh, your uh, unreliable datagram delivery that is supported by the network layer. And uh, what we have seen that uh, the packet delivery, the end to end packet delivery uh, at the network la layer is uh, unreliable and the transport layer provides certain end to end services uh, on top of that. Uh, so, from today onwards, we look into the details of all those services which are being provided uh, by the transport layer. So, um, uh, the first service uh, that we are going to talk about is uh, about the connection establishment. So, as we are looking or discussing in the last class that uh, the two end of the devices uh, which has the entire five layers of the protocol stack. Uh, so, the two end need to first set up a logical connection between themselves and this logical connection is something like that one person is saying about hello and another person is uh, replying back with another hello message and uh, they are uh, they establish a logical link among themselves uh, and um, uh, they are, they both of them become sure that they want to share the further uh, information among themselves. So, this connection establishment is to see that whether the other end uh, of the communication is live or not whether that is ready to receive the message or not and if it is ready to receive the message if it acknowledges then uh, we can safely start sending the data. So, in case of your um, uh, voice network uh, like the telephone network you can just do it by saying a hello because you know that it is a circuit switching network and whenever you are saying a hello uh, the packet will always or your message will always reach at the other end uh, the reliability is not an issue there. But uh, in case of a data uh, packet switching network, this reliability as an, is an issue because this entire packet switching network is working uh, on the basis of King principle where uh, as I was mentioning in the last class that every intermediate devices has certain fixed amount of buffer and uh, whenever you are putting certain packets into that or certain data into that and if your network load is too high it may happen that the buffer becomes full and packet starts getting dropped from that buffer. If it happens then uh, it becomes difficult uh, for you to understand or to ensure that whenever you are saying a hello uh, whether uh, that message is correctly being received by the other end or uh, the second scenario can be like the other end is not ready to receive your message and that is why it is not echoing back the hello message or not acknowledging your hello message. So, that is why ensuring this logical connection at a packet switching network for data delivery is little bit non-trivial compared to what is being used in case of your traditional circuit switching network or in a telephone network. So, we will look into the different as aspects of this connection establishment uh, in the context of uh, transport layer of the uh, TCP IP protocol stack that how you can uh, you can ensure that whatever hello message you are transferring to the other end, the other end is correctly receiving that hello message and correctly being able to decode that hello message and it is able to send you back with the required reply. So, let us look into the connection establishment in detail. So, the connection is just like a logical pipe. Uh, that ensures that both the ends are now ready to uh, send or receive further messages or further data. So, uh, let us see a very naive protocol of the connection establishment. So, we have in a we are in a client server model. So, uh, in this client server model uh, the client is trying to make a connection with the server. So, we say that the server is in a listen state, the server is listening for uh, the incoming connection. So, the client sends a connection request message. So, once the connect, uh, client sends the connection request message, the server is in the listen state. So, the server can listen that connection request message and it replies back with a connection acknowledgement message. So, this two way handshaking uh, is likely to work uh, for a uh, normal connection establishment purpose. But our life is not very simple in case of a packet switching network. So, 
um, the question is that this simple primitive where the client sends a connection request message and the server responses back with a connection acknowledgement message just like the hello protocol that we use in case of our telephone network whether that will work in the case of uh, a packet switching network or a data network or not. So, our target is to look here that this simple primitive for connection establishment whether this will work good for a uh, for a packet switching network or not. Now, the problem in the packet switching network is that the network can lose the packet, there can be packet loss from the network, there can be arbitrarily delay in delivering the packet, uh, there can be uh, delay in delivering the packet because it may happen that the intermediate routers which are there, uh, that intermediate routers uh, their buffer is almost full and it is receiving packet from multiple other links and it need to transfer the packet one after another. So, just like a scenario in a road congestion. So, whenever a road become congested then the speed of the cars becomes very slow uh, and all the cars are going to uh, enter to a common road uh, from multiple others road and in the road junction because it has a finite capacity that becomes the bottleneck and the congestion becomes uh, there because of which the speed of individual cars become very slow. The same thing can happen in a computer network because a router is receiving packets from multiple other neighboring routers and when it happens it may uh, in pay result in a uh, congestion in the network because of which the rate of packet becomes uh, very slow and that is why there can be this kind of arbitrarily delay in the network. Uh, the packet can get corrupted as well and uh, there is a possibility of uh, duplicate packet delivery because the transport layer also ensures reliability and the way of ensuring reliability in the transport layer is just like to monitor whether a packet is being received by the other end or not. If the packet is being received then I am happy, if the packet is not being received, if I am able to find out that the packet is not being received then what I will do that I will retransmit the packet after a timeout. Now it may happen in the network that well the earlier packet that I had transferred that packet got stuck somewhere, somewhere in some intermediate queue in the network because of the congestion or uh, this kind of network effect. And I am keep on waiting for the acknowledgement and I do not get the acknowledgement within that timeout duration. So, I think that well uh, the packet is probably got lost and then uh, I, I retransmit the packet again. But whenever I am retransmitting the packet again note that uh, the earlier packet was actually not lost rather the earlier packet um, was just waiting in a queue to get it delivered. So, because of this reason it may happen that well the other end the receiver may receive multiple packets. Uh, uh, of the multiple or better to say multiple copies of the same packet which we call as a duplicate packet. So, it may happen that there is this kind of duplicate data delivery in the network uh, because of this uh, retransmission uh, to ensure reliability. Now, uh, as I mentioned that uh, because packet may get delayed and got struck in the network due to congestion, uh, the uh, sender uh, assumes that the packet has been lost, it retransmit the packet and that way the receiver can get the duplicate packets. Now, when it happens, uh, you can think of a scenario like this that well, now the server has received two copies of the connection request. So, it has received one connection request here, uh, but remember that uh, this particular sequence number is not there uh, in the original packet, this is just to give you an indication that well there are two different connection request packets. So, the server has received one connection request packet and then it has received another connection request packet. It may happen that this particular connection request packet got delayed and it was transferred uh, by the intermediate router after some time uh, because of that delaying it has received late uh, compared to this first connection request packet. Now, the problem for the server is to find out that whether this connection request 1 that it has received whether that is a new connection request or it is a duplicate of the connection request 2 that, that it has already received. Now, the interesting fact here is that uh, it may happen that um, the server has crashed and reinitiated the connection. Uh, so, distinguishing between these two uh, becomes very difficult that um, whether uh, it is just like uh, 
new packet, new connection request message that is being received or it, it has happened that well uh, either the server or say for this example the client has crashed. Uh, after sending this first connection request packet and then the client is trying to establish another connection request. So, even if, if you forget this particular scenario, uh, it may happen that uh, uh, it may happen that uh, uh, well uh, yeah. Uh, so, it may happen that uh, say here is your uh, client and here is your server. So, the client has sent one uh, connection request message after the client has sent that connection request message say at this point the client has crashed. So, there is a crash here. So, the client got crashed and after some time the client uh, again reinitiates and it sends another connection request message to the server. Now, when the client sends this second connection request message to the server, it becomes difficult for the server to find out whether this connection request it is a new connection request or it is a duplicate of this connection request. Because remember that the server does not know whether the client has been crashed or not, that information has not reached to the server. So, because of all this reason, the entire principle of connection establishment in a uh, packet switching network is uh, very difficult uh, because you need to differentiate between the original request and its delayed duplicates and the challenge comes that how will you differentiate between the original request and the corresponding delayed duplicate. Uh, so, uh, in, in the context of collection establishment, we always has this kind of debate that whether we will go for the protocol correctness or we want to design a protocol which will perform good. Because if you want for the correctness, what you have to ensure that you need to add multiple other modules to differentiate between a new connection from a delayed duplicates. So, the question comes that uh, whenever you will execute those modules for finding out whether that is a old connection of or a delayed duplicate message or a new connection request this uh, entire protocol things become complicated and it reduces the overall performance because this works like a overhead for the data delivery. You are not actually doing the data delivery rather you are spending a uh, considerable amount of time just for establishing the connection. So, that is why you have this kind of debate on uh, whether we want a correct protocol or whether we still can work good with a compromised little compromised protocol which is not totally correct, it can fail under certain scenario, but still it will give good performance. So, this delayed duplicate they create a huge confusion in the packet switching network. So, in a major challenge uh, in a packet switching network is develop uh, a protocol uh, which will be able to handle the delayed duplicate. So, it is just like that sometime we design a protocol which will uh, completely be able to handle the delayed duplicates. So, we give the preference over correctness or sometime we give preference over performance and whenever we give preference over performance, still we need to find out a protocol which will have at least acceptable level of confirmation in handling the delayed duplicates in the network. So, let us see what are the different possible solution that can we, that can uh, have uh, in this context. Uh, so, first of all you can use throw a transport address or uh, the port number. So, uh, we have discussed this earlier that this port number it is a mapping between your transport layer and the corresponding application. Uh, so, it may happen uh, that um, multiple applications in your machine are trying to use the TCP protocol to transfer the data. So, it is just like that um, you have this uh, application 1 and application 2 which are running on a machine and both of them are transferring data. Now, whenever uh, your network protocol stack say this is the transport layer of your protocol stack, whenever it receives some data from a remote host, it need to find out whether that particular data is for um, application 1 or application 2. So, during that time we use the concept of port number 
to differentiate between application 1 and application 2. So, this port number application 1 runs in one port say it is running in 8080 port, application 2 runs in a different port say it is running in 23345 port. By looking into the port number in the transport layer header, we will be able to differentiate between application 1 and application 2. Now, Although we will be able to differentiate between the application, but the question comes that can we utilize this port number to differentiate between, um, uh, between the normal packet and the delayed duplicate. Now, if we design a protocol where uh, if a machine get crashed, it will use a different port number for initiating a new connection. If that is the case, then probably we will be able to solve this problem. So, it is just like that that our solution says that do not use a port number if it has been used once already. So, if you have already used a port, uh, so the delayed duplicate packets it will never find their way uh, to a transport process. So, it is just like that say um, this um, application 1, uh, say application 1, I am writing it an A1. Uh, it, it was uh, initiated a connection establishment message say port through port 8080 and after that this particular process get crashed. Now, uh, if you are running the application again then run it in a different port say 8082 if it is the case and if you are sending another connection establishment message here then uh, this earlier connection establishment message that you have sent through port 8080, whenever you will receive a reply of that, uh, say a reply of this connection establishment message that will also come in port 8080 and the transport layer will not be able to deliver that and it will correctly discard that particular reply message. And if a reply comes in port uh, 8082, the reply comes in port 8082, then the transport layer. Uh, will be able to deliver it to the application A1. So, this is a possible solution, but the problem comes that this solution is not feasible because we have a finite number of this kind of uh, uh, transport addresses support number because we have this finite uh, number of uh, ports. Uh, so, you cannot throw out a port number once it is being used. So, in that case uh, theoretically you will be requiring uh, infinite number of port addresses which is not feasible uh, for the practical implementation point of view and whenever also you are utilizing multiple applications. So, there are multiple applications which are trying to send data over the network. So, the second solution can be like that give each connection a unique identifier. Uh, which is chosen by the initiating party and put that unique uh, identifier in uh, each approach. Now, uh, this approach looks good, but the problem with this approach is that uh, every time you need to design a unique identifier and you need to ensure that the identifier is unique globally. So, ensuring that the identifier is uh, unique globally, uh, again the problem is that uh, what would be your algorithm to generate that identifier. And, um, uh, even if you design an algorithm to generate a unique identifier which will be able to sustain even after a system is getting crashed, uh, you have to obviously use certain kind of hardware trigger here because uh, you want to initiate that even after the system get crashed and recover from that crash, it will not use the old um, identifier that is uh, being utilized once. Uh, so, that is why this particular um, uh, algorithm also has a uh, amount of overhead associated with it. So, the third possible solution that uh, we can utilize is to design a mechanism to kill off the aged packet or the old packets the network. Uh, so, that is just like the restricting the packet lifetime. So, if you look into the problem that we are facing, it is because of the delayed duplicates. So, the duplicate packets which have been transmitted earlier, but that got struck somewhere in the network. Now, those packets have been uh, being transferred to the other end. So, whenever those are being transferred to the other end, then the other end uh, is in a confusion whether that delayed duplicate is just because the system has got crashed and uh, now recovered and sent a new packet, new connection request packet or it is just a, a delayed duplicate of the old connection request packet through which the connection has already been established. So, if uh, because uh, all these problems our life becomes complicated because of this delayed duplicate. If we can eliminate the possibility of delayed, delayed duplicate from the network, uh, uh, then, then this entire solution becomes simple. Now, the question comes that how we will be able to uh, eliminate the delayed duplicate from the network. And the solution is that if you associate with a packet lifetime, 
with every individual packet that you are sending in the network. Then uh, you can say or you can design a protocol that well uh, once you are sending a new connection request message you will make sure that the old connection request message it has already died of or it has already been taken out of the network because its lifetime has been expired. So, this particular solution tree it makes it possible to design a feasible solution. Now, let us see that how you can design this solution. So, the first requirement is that you need to restrict the packet lifetime, you need to design a way to restrict the packet lifetime. So, there are three different ways to restrict the packet lifetime. The first one is that you make a restricted network design. That means, you prevent the packets from looping. You can have a uh, maximum delay bound uh, which also include the congestion delay on every individual packet and if a packet expires that particular time uh, from its originating time, uh, then that packet is automatically dropped from the network. The second is that uh, second solution is that you put a hop count information in uh, each packet. Uh, so, the idea is that uh, whenever you are sending a packet uh, in the transport layer, in that packet you put a maximum hop count value, say the maximum hop count value is 10. Now, whenever a packet is uh, being traversed over the network, uh, then every individual hop just reduces that hop count. So, whenever it goes to the first hop router, uh, it reduces it from 10 to 9, whenever it goes to the second hop router, the second hop router reduces it from 9 to 8 and that way it goes on. And whenever that hop count becomes 0, it will simply drop that packet. So, this is a very feasible solution which is indeed used uh, in today's network uh, to ensure that a packet is not hopping in the network for uh, infinite duration. Uh, the third possible solution is you put a timestamp with each packet uh, and that particular time uh, timestamp will define the lifetime of a packet. Um, but this particular solution is uh, not very feasible or not very practical from a network perspective because in that case you require proper time synchronization among individual devices in the network which is very difficult to achieve in a uh, in a real scenario. Uh, because uh, whenever you have two different systems, there will be certain clock drift uh, between these two systems. So, ensuring um, uh, this um, lifetime based on the time stamping of each packet where you will be requiring strict synchronization across different devices ensuring that is little bit different. So, normally we go to the second solution that we put a hop count information at every individual packet and whenever the packet is being delivered uh, by the network layer through the routing algorithm at every individual router or at, at every individual hop uh, it decrements that hop count value and uh, whenever it reaches to certain um, maximum hop when the hop count value becomes 0 during that time that router if it receives a packet or receives a uh, data packet with uh, hop count value 0, it simply drops that packet. Well, uh, our entire design challenge here is that we need to guarantee not only that a packet is dead, but all acknowledgement of it are also dead. Uh, so, this is an interesting requirement because whenever you are sending a connection request message, uh, it may happen that from the server side and here is the client side, say from the client side you have sent a connection request message and then the client got crashed and it has restarted again, say it has restarted again at this point. Now, here it receives the reply message. Now, if it replies a reply message and just before sending the reply message, if it has sent another connection request, then by looking into this reply, the client will be in a dilemma whether this reply is the reply corresponds to the old request or it is the reply corresponds to this new request that it has just sent out. Uh, because remember this, uh, so although for the explaining purpose I am marking it as blue and brown but the client cannot see it as a blue or brown. Uh, so, the client just looks into that it is a reply to the connection request message that it has already sent out and it has got a reply. So, it is in a dilemma or it will not be able to correctly decode whether that reply is uh, uh, the, uh, the delayed duplicate or because of this crash failure the uh, reply of the earlier connection request that it has sent. Uh, so, we need to design mechanism to prevent uh, this kind of thing so that the client actually 
be able to differentiate between this blue and brown and it can find out that well the reply message that it has received it is the reply corresponds to the blue request and not the brown request and it can correctly drop that uh, particular reply message. So, we need to guarantee that uh, not only a packet is dead, but all acknowledgement to that packets are also dead. So, uh, let us see that how we can do this uh, or how we can handle the delayed duplicates during the case of connection establishment. So, we define a maximum packet lifetime t and uh, we make it sure that if we wait for this uh, t duration, uh, then if you wait for this t duration, then um, you can be sure that all traces of it that means the packet are on also its acknowledgement they are now gone from the network. So, uh, all the packets and all the traces of its acknowledgements are dead. Now, to ensure that uh, in case of a generic trans transport layer protocol which is also uh, utilized in the con concept of TCP. So, rather than using a physical clock because uh, uh, the problem of having a physical clock is that you require clock synchronization which is difficult to achieve in the internet scale we use the concept of a virtual clock. So, what is this virtual clock? This virtual clock is a sequence number field which is generated based on the clock tick. So, uh, it is just like that every individual packet that you are sending out that individual packet will contain a sequence number and by looking into that sequence number you will become sure whether uh, that particular packet was uh, the intended um, packet or not. So, the question comes is that how will you design that sequence number or whether there is still a problem even if you design a sequence numbering mechanism. So, uh, here is the broad idea that you label every seg segment with a sequence number and that particular sequence number will not be reused within that t second duration. So, what we say that within that t second duration every segment or every packet that I have sent into the network it will die off the packet will die off as well as all traces of that packet that means, if there is certain acknowledgement for that packet they will also get die off. So, with this particular principle you can say that if you are not going to reuse that sequence number um, within that t second of duration you will be able to ensure that at any time there would be only a single instance of a packet with a unique sequence number. So, just giving you an example say you have transferred a packet um, of uh, say sequence number uh, 1 to 5 sequence number 125 and you say t equal to 1 minute. That means, you are trying to ensure that once you have transmitted a packet with say sequence number 125 within this 1 minute duration this particular sequence number 125 is not going to be reused. If you can ensure that then you know that after 1 minute duration the packet that you have sent to it uh, sequence number 125 that is going to die off uh, from the network. So, uh, um, so uh, the packet will be there in the network for 1 minute and within that 1 minute duration if you are not sending any other packet with the same sequence number the same sequence number 125 then you will be sure that well no traces of this packet um, uh, no other traces or the duplicate traces of the packets will be there in your network. So, um, so that way you will be able to ensure that whenever the other end will receive a packet with this sequence number 125 that is the only packet that is uh, traversing in the network are not a delayed duplicate of that particular packet. So, this period t and the rate of packets per second determines the size of the sequence number. So, we want to ensure that at most one packet with a given sequence number may be outstanding at any given time. So, uh, it is just like that once you have sent a packet with a sequence number 125 within that t second duration or within that t duration you do not send any other packet with the same sequence number. So, only that packet with the sequence number 125 is outstanding in the uh, network within that uh, particular duration. So, 
here we have uh, two important requirements that we need to ensure. Uh, so, these two requirements was uh, uh, published by Tomlinson in 1975 in a part breaking work uh, titled selecting sequence numbers. So, the first requirement is that the sequence numbers they must be chosen such that a particular sequence number refer never refers to more than one byte. Uh, uh, so, if you are using byte sequence number. So, byte sequence number means that for every individual byte that you are sending in the network, they has a sequence number. So, the TCP type of protocol it uses byte sequence number rather than the packet sequence number. So, in case of a packet sequence number for every individual packet that you are transferring in the network, you put one sequence number for the packet. For the byte sequence number, every individual byte that you are transferring in the network, you put one sequence number for that. So, the byte sequence number is something like this like um, uh, if your packet has some 100 byte data. So, the packet has 100 byte data. So, in the header field uh, you have two different field one is the sequence number another is the length. So, uh, the length says that you have 100 byte of data the sequence number field is say 500 that means in this particular packet you have data from 500 bytes to 600 bytes, uh, 501 bytes to 600 bytes. So, you have total uh, 100 bytes of data. So, that way uh, you can use the byte sequence numbering to individually identify every bytes in the network. So, that would be useful later on we will see for uh, ensuring segment wise delivery uh, on top of our transport layer protocol. Uh, so, uh, the requirement here is that uh, every sequence number that you are sending to the network it indicates to only a single byte not more than one bytes. So, there should not be more than one bytes in the network uh, for the same, same same source destination pairs which are referenced by a single sequence number. Now, in this case the challenge comes that how will you choose the initial sequence number. Uh, the initial sequence number is required during the connection establishment phase when you are trying to uh, send data to a, a remote host. So, that was the first requirement we will see that how you can choose the initial sequence number uh, during the connection establishment phase and the second requirement is that the valid range of sequence number must be positively synchronized between the sender and the receiver whenever a connection is being used. So, this means that uh, whenever you have set up this um, initial sequence number then all the subsequent bytes will follow that sequence number. So, uh, this is basically ensured by the flow control algorithm. So, later on we will see the uh, different types of flow control algorithms which actually ensures that once the sender and the receiver or the client and the server has agreed upon the initial sequence numbers, then the flow control algorithm ensures that well uh, the packets or the bytes that you are going to transfer it follows that sequence of the sequence number. So, uh, the one example can be uh, something like this like um, say uh, you have a client and uh, you have a server. Now, the client sends a request message with say initial sequence number as 1000 and the server sends a reply mentioning that it accepts the initial sequence number as 1000. Now, once this connection establishment is being done, then all the subsequent packets that is being sent by the client, it follows this uh, sequence number space. So, uh, the first packet say it will start from 1001 and uh, it has the length of 50 bytes. So, uh, these things I am writing in the form of sequence number comma length. So, that means, um, uh, the first packet starts from 1001 and it has a length of 50, the second packet starts from then 1051 and it can have a length of 100, then the third packet starts from 1151 and it can say length of another 50. So, this particular thing the sequence numberings that at what sequence the packets will be transferred that is handled by the flow control algorithm. So, later on we will see that how flow control algorithm actually ensures that. So, this particular mechanism we call it that 
between the client and the server between the two ends uh, you should have a positive synchronization uh, for uh, ensuring that every individual packets are having following the sequence number which have been established during this uh, initial handshaking phase and the sequence numbering follows uh, that particular principle. Now, here you will see that once this initial handshaking is done, the problem is gone, the problem will be taken care of by the flow control algorithm. But the problem is the first requirement which is there that how will you choose this initial sequence number? Because for this subsequent packet, say this is packet 1, this is packet 2, this is packet 3, for the subsequent packets you have this referencing, the reference of the sequence number. Uh, that uh, which particular sequence number you are going to use based on what sequence number has already been utilized. So, this uh, uh, individual sequence number like 1001, 1051, 1151 they are known uh, once this initial handshaking is done, but this initial sequence number it is unknown. So, that need to be established and during this establishment of the initial sequence number you need to ensure that whichever initial sequence number you are going to use that is not going to be reused within certain duration of uh, t. So, that time bound uh, need to be there and within that time duration uh, that initial sequence number is not going to be reused such that the server it can differentiate between a uh, correctly sent connection request and a delayed duplicate of it. Uh, so, uh, that is that is the broad requirement uh, that we have uh, in the uh, context of uh, connection establishment. Well, uh, so this is the problem that we have like uh, once uh, a particular machine it is uh, once a particular machine it is um, trying to send the data it has chosen one initial sequence number and it is transferring the data uh, on top of the network and we have a packet lifetime t and that means every byte that you are sending using this sequence number field that will be there in the network for this time duration t. Now, if this connection get crashed and uh, if you are uh, initiating another connection with this initial sequence number uh, say with, uh, with this initial sequence number then the problem is that you can see that here you have two different packets, you may have two different packets which are there in the network. One is the old packet from the connection 1 which was still there in the network and the new packet from connection 2. So, there can be a confusion. Uh, so, uh, we want to avoid this kind of confusion here that uh, we want that well the connection 2 should not initiate from this point rather a connection 2 will either initiate from this point. So, you wait for sufficient amount of duration and then initiate the new connection with a new sequence number so that you can become sure that this connection 1 and the connection 2 their sequence number field does not get um, overlapped, uh, does not get overlapped or the second thing is that uh, you use a sequence number which is high enough from uh, the sequence number field that you have used for the connection 1. During that time you also be able to ensure that the sequence number zone. Uh, of connection 1 and connection 2 they does not get overlapped and um, there is uh, no confusion in uh, uh, the sequence number. Uh, so, uh, that is our requirement. So, we want to either either wait for a duration so that we make ensure that all the previous bytes with the old sequence number that are gone out of the network or you use a initial sequence number which is high enough compared to the previous sequence number that has been utilized uh, for this connection establishment. So, that the uh, connection zone of two nodes they does not get with each other. So, here in this diagram this particular zone this blue zone or here this red zone we call is a forbidden range. So, we call it as a forbidden range okay? because once one sequence number is being used you should not reuse the sequence number anymore. So, in the next class we will look into the details about how you can design a, a mechanism for selecting the initial sequence number. So, that uh, you can avoid the overlapping of the forbidden zones for two different connection. So, see you all in the next class. Thank you.